Hi, I'm Jesse Waters and for Bill O'Reilly. Thanks for watching us tonight. Let's get right into our top story. Germany's still reeling after that deadly truck attack on a Christmas market in Berlin. ISIS is taking credit for the attack, leading former New York City Mayor Rudy Giuliani to slam President Obama's foreign policy legacy. He's going out of office, leaving us a world much more dangerous than the world that he was given. He was given a stable, I wouldn't say stable, but relatively stable Iraq. Certainly not stable a, enough for him to feel good about pulling the troops out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stable enough so he could have reduced the troops. He never should have pulled the troops out. Mm -hmm. That was pulling the plug. That opened the whole thing. Joining us now from Santa Fe with reaction, New Mexico <laughs> Governor Bill Richardson, a former that U.S. ambassador to the working. United Nations. So, Governor, uh, you disagree uh, with Rudy Giuliani's assessment that, uh, that President Obama has now Trump handed yeah, over President Trump a very dangerous that. world, so and he himself with, was uh, handed a relatively stable Middle East. Do you disagree with that? Well, I do disagree, although I would have thought Rudy Giuliani would have been a, a better candidate for Secretary of State because he is respected abroad for his national security and counterterrorism credentials. But no, I think President Obama uh, was elected. Uh, the American people wanted to get out of Iraq. It, uh, that wasn't working. And he fulfilled that commitment. Uh, I don't believe that uh, ISIS came from that decision. I mean, Donald Trump wanted to get out of Iraq. That was one of his campaign platforms. Yes. So I disagree with uh, with Rudy. I do think President Obama had a sound military and diplomatic strategy to to defeat ISIS. But right. ISIS is around. They're dangerous. They're still there, Jesse. Right. I know that the American public wanted to get out of Iraq when President Obama was elected, but they did not want to leave Iraq so that ISIS could take over. Because what happened now is ISIS is now in 30 different countries. They've launched attacks in the U.S. homeland. The European streets are filled with blood now. And it's not a safe place. Syria's in civil war. Yemen's in civil war. Libya's a failed state. You cannot say that President Obama has kept things stable in the Middle East. You just can't say that. Well, look, it's turmoil. It's a disaster area. Um, what I'm concerned about is, all right, uh, President-elect Trump wants to defeat ISIS. He wants to destroy him, and I'm, I'm for that. And, and I want to give him the benefit of the doubt. He's not in yet. You can't really criticize anything that he's done specifically. What I worry about, Jesse, is what he's saying, that this is a clash of civilizations. He's playing into ISIS's propaganda by making this a contest between the Muslims and the West and ISIS and Muslims. Most of those that are killed are Muslims. ISIS kills them. And, and, and what we don't want to do is become a propaganda tool for ISIS by making this a clash of civilizations between Christians and Muslims and yeah. ISIS. I do see what you're saying, that this extreme rhetoric you believe leads to terrorists recruiting more effectively. But I would argue that President Obama, by twisting himself into pretzels and not labeling it Islamic extremism, by basically emptying out Gitmo, in Europe. What I'm concerned about is that by just talking about a clash of civilizations by saying that ISIS is an extremist group, which it is, and not talking about those moderate Muslims that we're going to need, moderate Muslims countries to fight ISIS, Muslim communities in the United States to help us root out potential ISIS sympathizers in the United States that were working against our purposes. But the reality yeah. is, you know, President-elect Trump, he's not in yet. And I, I you know, I want to see what comes out of this military policy. All right, we're going to bomb them more. I accept that. I think that makes sense. But you're ne you need diplomatic tools. You need to build a coalition of European countries. You've got to have Germany with us. And right now, you know, ISIS has targeted Germany because it's one of the most 
tolerant country for Muslims. We need Angela Merkel, right. and she's being weakened by these terrorist attacks and by us saying, listen, uh, what, uh, what, what ISIS is saying is let's bring those uh, Muslims into ISIS, and they're doing that by using simplistic language, and then when we talk about a clash of Got civilizations, it. Donald Trump, that feeds into ISIS. Got it. That's you, all you, I'm I saying. understand you want Donald Trump to be less honest about the enemy he's trying to defeat. I do understand understand that. I just disagree with it. Let's talk about Germany really quickly here. What's happening in Germany is a result of the migration crisis that was started by President Obama not enforcing his own red line. He said he was going to do something about it. He didn't do anything about it. We sat by and watched this humanitarian crisis unfold. We've sat by and watched death after death after death in Aleppo and all over the Middle East, especially in Syria. So then you feel guilty and you want to take all these refugees in, but there's no way to vet these people. Merkel has taken them in. President Obama wants to take more in right now to this day. He's still opening up the floodgates. Isn't this a direct result of the vacuum of power that this president has created? created in Syria by not doing anything about it? You have people coming in willy-nilly, you can't check them. Wouldn't you agree with that? Well, first of all, Angela Merkel has tightened a lot of the security points. It doesn't to look very tight, Governor. In. It doesn't look very but, tight. But they secondly, got attacked secondly, about seven times this secondly, year. But secondly, aliens coming into Europe. And Germany, yeah, they're a progressive country that has been humanitarian oriented. They've allowed a million in. What are you going to do with these refugees? They're dying. They're uh, fleeing from political persecution. Well, you got to listen. Time, we want to be humanitarian. We want to keep people safe, but not at the expense of our own citizens. Governor, I got to run. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. All right. Next on the rundown, the left continues to be in full freak out mode over President elect Trump. Are their theatrics just hurting their own cause? We'll have a debate when we come right back. Talking points are brought to you by Valero. The winning the Electoral College. But that hasn't stopped liberals from saying wild things about the president-elect. I think we do have to regard this as not a normal presidency. Uh, you know, some people say, oh, well, it's just a, uh, we've had conservative, pompous, uh, narcissistic presidents before. Uh, this is, this is not normal. Uh, this is really dangerous. Uh, and we have to resist. We have to have a peaceful resistance. But also, uh, individually, we need to boycott Trump products. Joining us now from Houston, Sarah Flores, former deputy campaign manager for Carly Fiorina's presidential campaign. And in Washington, D.C., David Goodfriend, a Democratic strategist who served in the Clinton administration. So, David, yeah. so, the Democrats not very good at winning, but now it looks like they're not very good at losing also. Since their defeat, they've rioted, they've called for recounts, they've threatened the Electoral College people, they've blamed Russia, they've blamed fake news. Now they're trying to disrupt the inauguration. Shouldn't you guys start focusing on winning instead of whining? Well, uh, that's a nice send up, but it's not Thank what you. I'm observing. Here in Washington, what I'm observing is Senator Tammy Baldwin of Wisconsin, Senator Sherrod Brown of Ohio, Senator Stabenow of Michigan, all signing on to letters to President elect Trump saying, We want to work with you on the following issues infrastructure, bringing manufacturing back, punishing companies for sending jobs overseas. They're ready, willing, and able to work with Donald Trump on that because they know it's exactly what their states need. Now, I think that's the question a good idea. is whether or not the question is whether or not, quite frankly, Donald Trump and the Republican leadership in Congress will actually come through on their promises. Will we see infrastructure spending on roads, bridges, airports? Will we see manufacturing brought back? I mean, the Republicans run everything now: the White House, the House, the Senate. It's on them. But you've got Democrats like Tammy Baldwin, like Sherrod Brown, willing, ready, and able to work with the incoming president. And I think that's actually a hopeful sign. I actually I think that's smart politics. Instead of trying to protest this guy and be the party of no, which they accuse the Republican Party of being for the last eight years, when you can cooperate with Donald Trump, I think they need to do that yeah, because or it, else it they're going to be in deep trouble. Now, Sarah, do you think yeah. that uh, the left is panicking because they've been shut out of power 
worse than they have been since 1928? Or do they fear that President Trump could be so successful that it could really banish them into the electoral wilderness? Well, frankly, I think they've been acting entitled. They thought this election was theirs when Donald Trump won. They feel like it was taken from them. When, in fact, if you look over the last eight years, and they've lost nearly 1,000 state House seats, uh, 12 governorships, 13 Senate seats, 69 House seats, this wasn't a one-off election. But what Democrats have then done, which I think is just politically dumb, real dumb, is they've reacted to it by, again, looking backwards with this entitlement attitude that I don't think will help them in 18 when they have so many Senate states up that Donald Trump won. So this recount, uh, pretending that the Electoral College doesn't count anymore, like there is no U.S. Constitution all of a sudden, uh, trying to, to make this, again, the Clinton campaign participating in the recount, it's, it's a huge, huge right. mistake on their part, again, looking to 18. This can't be good for the Democratic Party brand. I think you would agree with that, David. Now, you said something earlier well, wait, about... Respond? Yeah, you should go, go ahead. Respond to Sarah. Yeah, sure. I mean, look, uh, the, some of the biggest, most important states in this country are run by Democrats, California, Illinois, New York. You take a look at the percentage of our GDP that California alone represents, you're talking about a booming success story. You look at Minnesota versus Wisconsin. Wisconsin, my home state where Republicans took over run, running everything now, Democrats run Minnesota. Which state is doing better economically? Minnesota. So in the states, we're going to see plenty of examples of where Democrats' progressive policies actually work for everybody, and we can hold that up against whatever it is Donald sure, Trump yeah, is going to we'll do. We don't that. really know. We may see we that. We may not see do. that. But I think I when President Obama tried to split the Republican Party in half, he tried to separate the Tea Party wing from the more establishment Republican traditional wing. I think well, you're going to see. Well, got rid of Boehner. I think it worked. I think you're going to see. Boehner was red on a reel. Yeah, okay. And now you have Paul Ryan, so sink your teeth into him. Um, now so you're going to see Donald Trump kind of split the Democratic Party in a way you just described. You're going to see Rust Belt Democrats, manufacturing Democrats in a Pennsylvania, Ohio situation, maybe come on to the Republican Party platform yep. when it comes to trade well, to and jobs Trump. in manufacturing. And you're going to have the Pelosi's and the Warren's out on this fringe left wing. And that's going to be damaging. Wouldn't you agree, Sarah? Oh, absolutely. And by the way, to hold up California as an example of democratic policies, let's do Booming it. State. That's a state Booming with the state. highest highest poverty rates in the nation. It's been exporting jobs to Texas, my home state, for a decade. Texas has been losing to California for a decade. California is crushing Texas. California is crushing <laughs> Texas. Highest poverty rate in the nation. So All right, well, listen, I'll, I'll let, let you guys their, fight it out over brand. who's the better state. <laughs> but a uh, very funny debate. Thank you guys very much. Directly ahead, new documents from the Hillary Clinton email case have been made public, igniting a new debate over whether the Trump administration should reopen the investigation into her. We'll analyze the situation up next. Critics everywhere are raving about fences. A man got to take care of his... Tonight, ...should the Trump administration prosecute Hillary Clinton. A federal judge yesterday unsealed a search warrant that showed agents were concerned classified information on Hillary Clinton's private email server made its way to Anthony Weiner's computer. Weiner is the estranged husband of Clinton aide Huma Abedin, and he's currently under federal investigation for sexting with an underage girl. President-elect Trump raised the alarm about the situation during the campaign. Uma is getting classified secrets. She's married to Anthony Weiner. Who's a perv? Oh, he is. He is. Do you think there's even a 5% chance that she's not telling Anthony Weiner now of a public relations firm what the hell is coming across? Do you think there's even a little bit of a chance? I don't think so. Joining us now from Washington, John Flannery, a former federal yeah. prosecutor. And from Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, Dan Bongino, a former Secret Service agent and radio talk show host. So Flannery, you just have to admit that President-elect Trump was correct in his assessment <laughs> about Anthony Weiner. Does it pain you to admit that Trump is correct? That, that, the, uh, that her husband was a perv? I didn't think that was the question. Uh, I think the question no, is, that there was why suspicious did they issue a search warrant? On Weiner's laptop? Well, well, 
The, there was no probable cause to get a search warrant. That's what we know now that we've seen the search warrant. And we know that Comey violated the very order they sought, which was to keep mum about the investigation. And within days of getting a court order saying they weren't going to talk about it, he's talking about it everywhere within days of the election. Okay, so finally, let me stop you. Let me just stop you there. Anything. Let me just stop you there. So okay. the FBI guys are looking into Wiener's laptop because he's sexting some teenage chick. And they find out <laughs> probable cause that there are communications, no. probable no. cause to look no, because no, there no, are no, communications no. potentially between Huma Abedin and Hillary Clinton. You don't want Hillary's communications in Anthony Weiner's laptop. You don't whoa, want whoa, that, whoa, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa! Wait a second. First of all, just going back to our boy Trump, the man child. The communications whoa, whoa, whoa. Flaring, between flaring. Hillary, the communications be kind, okay? between be, be nice to President Elect Trump. It's, it's President Elect Trump to you. No, not to me. To Have you. some respect. I, I know he's not my President Elect. He's his <laughs> accidency. To me, wow. He is, he We're going to deport not. you, Flannery. I think <laughs> you're going to be the first one out of here. I think a couple of people can see it, so I don't think it's going to be a big secret. Good. The, but here's my point. Yeah. Both Hillary and Aberdeen. Both had security clearances. They're allowed to communicate about these things. Number two, they had the identification of the 2,000 or whatever less number of emails that were in question. And all they had to do was check it with the ones they investigated during the summer. And a short time later, after the election, uh, just before the election, they said, yes, they're duplicates. So there was no probable cause okay. to begin this Can I search. get Dan in here? Flannery seems to be okay yeah. with... Hillary's classified information on Wiener's laptop. What do you say? Yeah, yeah. With all due respect to John, he's completely embarrassing himself on the one of the largest <laughs> no, cable TV shows out there. No, no, finish. you should be because when you actually, yeah, I, I didn't interrupt you, John. When you read the search well, warrant, which I did, and prepared. For, well, because you, you couldn't have because I wasn't checking up till Flannery, now. Let him finish. So, let him finish. Okay. Thank you, John. Well, listen, I'm sorry, Go you're embarrassing it. yourself, and that's why I'm on the segment See, to, to call you out on this. Uh, I read the why search you warrant. You, you should have done that yourself. Flannery, we're going to have to cut your mic John. a la O'Reilly if you yeah. don't shut your mouth. Let me finish, <coughs> please. Whoa, please. Whoa. Ex ex please. Ex exercise a bit of self-control. It it helps. Control. Exercise a modicum of self-control. I'm not No, shouting. you don't, because you're a liberal. Right, liberals don't have self-control. Flannery, Flannery, Flannery. I think you should take a We're actually, actually going to cut your mic. I haven't if heard you, you don't say stop talking, yet. he will talk and you will respond. Go. I'd be glad to so, do that. So, Jesse, if you actually read the search warrant, which I did preparing for this segment, you will see in the search warrant that they clearly lay out the fact that classified information had been exchanged before between Huma Abedin and Mrs. Clinton, had John said, but as John said before. But John's leaving out the critical component of that. It wasn't yeah. done over a government system. Hello? That's the whole component of the crime. Uh, John no, was a lawyer no, for the government, no. and he's leaving out the one component of the story. That's the actual crime. Well, come no, on, McFly. Like, wake up on this one. You're a lawyer. The crime requires <laughs> intent. Okay, guys. It requires no, 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 legal he's lying. Jumbo, no, both he's lying. Guys. Let he's me lying. ask John a question. John, yes, for the sir. Democrats to complain constantly about Russia hacking this election. It's funny, it's kind of like when you leave your door at home unlocked and you complain about getting robbed. Because all of this information was unsecure. It was in a homebroom server. It was on Anthony Weiner's laptop. John Podesta handed over his password <laughs> to a hacker. I mean, come on, you're just giving this stuff away. The you can't complain Jesse about it afterwards. Hacked. Jesse, it's the only system that was not hacked. Yeah, really. Her system was secure. Oh, and you know that. They never got anything from her That's system. That's not what Comey said. Comey said there was probable no, cause to believe that, that no, foreign no. entities hacked her email server. No. All no, right. they didn't know. Yes, they, they did. did. Not. Okay, they so you're just going to believe that server. on a whim? They hacked the DNC server. They hacked the DNC but emails. You don't know, they, they, they hacked Podesta's emails. They did not hack her server. That's what you think. All right, no, Flannery. No, that's what I know. Thank you very much. And, John, okay. I appreciate you uh, dealing with Flannery. Plenty more ahead as the factory moves along this evening. Walmart stopped selling a controversial Black Lives Matter t-shirt due to police pressure. But did the company go far enough? And a YouTube star claims he was kicked off a Delta fight for speaking Arabic. But is he telling the truth? We hope you stay tuned for those reports. 
Headquarters, I'm Jackie Abanez in New York. A Europe-wide manhunt is underway for the suspect in Monday's Christmas market attack in Berlin, Germany. The suspect has been identified as Anis Amri, 24-year-old Tunisian. You can see him right there. According to German, Amri had been kept under surveillance for six months earlier this year. He is accused of ramming a stolen truck into the market crowd, killing 12 people and injuring dozens of others. Snow and cold temperatures making for a brutal exit from Aleppo, Syria. Hundreds of rebel fighters and civilians swaddled in thick blankets were bussed out of the war-ravaged city earlier today. Their departure from Aleppo paves the way for President Bashar Assad to assume full control there. After more than four years of fighting over Syria's largest city, the civil war has killed more than 250,000 people and displaced millions. I'm Jackie Abanez. Now back to the O'Reilly Factor. In the Unresolved Problem segment tonight, more Black Lives Matter controversy. Yesterday, Walmart announced it would no longer sell these shirts on its website. As you can see, they say, bulletproof Black Lives Matter. Walmart made the decision in response to a complaint from the Fraternal Order of Police, who claimed the store was, quote, profiting from racial division, unquote. However, the website is still selling Black Lives Matter t-shirts without the word bulletproof. Joining us now with reaction is Alex Ferrer, former circuit court judge in Florida, who also is a former police officer. And in Washington, D.C., Jamila Bay, a radio talk show host. So, Jamila, you understand why police officers would not like this T-shirt, especially the bulletproof when it comes to Black Lives Matter. They believe it's inflammatory and they believe that it actually hurts their ability to do their job effectively on the streets. Do you understand their concern about the t-shirt? Actually, I think that their concern should be that a shirt that says bulletproof has no Kevlar content whatsoever. That's false advertising. The fact of the matter is police are not concerned about what a t-shirt in Walmart has to say about anything. Police officers are there to protect, to serve, and frankly, this is a huge distraction from issues that really matter. A t-shirt, come on, an officer is not concerned about, well, what t-shirt was he wearing when the 911 call came in? No, it's not about the t-shirt that the perp or whoever was wearing. It's about profiting off merchandise with, with, which incites hatred towards police. You can see why Bulletproof would do that. Don't you agree that this shirt is a little provocative and might, you know, cause concern among police departments? You're speaking Frankly, to me. Yeah, yeah, Judge. I'm speaking okay. to the judge now. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, yeah, no, of course. As a, as a I guess it's a matter of whose ox is being gored. If you're a police officer, of course you find it offensive because the, you know, the, the Black Lives Matter group, unlike a lot of other people, I don't find Black Lives Matter itself to be offensive in any way or racist because they only focus on black lives or uh, because they, uh, they don't focus on black on black crime. They only focus on their perception of police on black crime. Because I could start a group that called Hispanic Lives Matter and only focus on Hispanics who've been injured by. German Shepherd owners. That's just the group I founded. However, the, the problem is that they're, I disagree with their premise. Their premise is police officers are unfairly targeting African Americans. That is simply not true. It's not supported by any FBI statistics. The, the uh, Harvard professor who conducted the study determined, to his surprise, he actually admitted, that the statistics show that it is not in any way an increase in shootings of, of blacks by police officers. Uh, and it supports the study by Washington State that shows that whites are more likely to be shot than blacks, not based on population, in shoot, don't shoot scenarios. So the narrative, Black Lives Matter is putting on that shirt, bulletproof, is sending a message to the public that, like, hey, cops are all shooting. Shooting us, so here, here's a shirt that says bulletproof. So that's why cops are offended by the T-shirt, and uh, and I think it was right for Walmart to say, you know what, you know, we, we want to sell T-shirts. They also sell Blue Lives Matter and they sell All Lives Matter T-shirts. And they can sell whatever T-shirts they, they want. I don't yes, care what kind of T-shirts they, they, they sell. They wanted to take off the bulletproof label. Right, and, and, they, and, and I think that was right. And that's their uh, that's their whatever they want. They can do. It's the private company. So Jamila, mm -hmm. Black Lives Matter not on a great run recently. I'm just going to read some things that they've been caught up in. Okay, Chan for dead cops, a protester shot Allegedly. a cop in Ferguson, no it's on tape, uh, uh, a supporter <laughs> killed a Kentucky cop, mm -hmm. an activist was busted for human trafficking, so here's one the of the, thing. hold on let me finish, there's more, mm -hmm. one of the leaders um, says that police officers are committing ethnic cleansing, and then a, a Louisiana Black Lives Matter protester knocked a police officer's teeth out with a brick. Mm -hmm. Seeing all that, 
Can you understand why police officers aren't thrilled with the idea of Walmart selling a t-shirt with the well, word bulletproof on it in relation to Black Lives Matter? These aren't great people. Well, here is the thing, my friend. What you yes, have to keep friend. in mind is this. Yeah, and, and I do want this to be a conversation of sure. people who want to be you know, uh, upfront about the fact that we American citizens have the right to free speech. That also means that we have the right to buy shirts with inflammatory statements on them. To be honest, I don't really understand bulletproof when there's no okay, Kevlar let me, in the let shirt. Let me stop you there. Would you be upset if they were selling a t-shirt which people thought was encouraging violence against women? Um, yes, I would be. You would I be. absolutely would be. Even if but women's you know groups were protesting Walmart and police. asking Walmart to take the shirts off the Anyone, rack? any individual, any group that is not the government, the FOP, as they are uh, agents of the state, police officers work for the people of whatever jurisdiction they happen to be uh, founded in or whatever. When the agents of the state get involved in speech, I've got a problem. When police are saying, it's, you can't say that, violation. I've got a problem with you saying this, that, the other, and we sure. police officers don't like it. I go, whoa, wait a minute. That is contrary to what no, our first I, amendment I guarantees that point. us here. I understand so it's a constitutional that, issue. Judge, I'll give you the it, last one to respond real quick. The thing, the thing is, it is, not, it is not a constitutional. First amendment, of course, yes. first, the first amendment, of course, uh, protects free speech, but that only protects it from governmental action. FOP, the PBA, you know, Fraternal Order Police, or Police Benevolent Association are police unions. They're not a branch of the government. They're representatives of individual police officers in the bargaining and negotiating of their contracts. So in that respect, they represent police officers as a group, and they try to get Walmart to take something off that's offensive for police officers. Is judge, that is, that difference is, is, is not distinction. That is not, and it very much is when you're dealing with the law. That is not actionable as anything to do with free speech. That you know, Walmart was right to take the shirt off because it was offensive to some segment of the population. All right, well, let's all go to Walmart and buy some T-shirts, guys. You Thank go. you guys very much. When we come right back, an illegal immigrant who has been deported eight times is still on the run after a fatal hit and run in, Louis in Louisville, Kentucky. What does that say about America's immigration laws? That report after these messages. We the second factor follow-up segment tonight, the consequences of illegal immigration. Earlier this month, the factor told you about this man, Miguel Angel Villasensor, a 40-year-old illegal immigrant wanted for killing two innocent women in a fatal hit and run in Louisville, Kentucky. Villasensor had been deported from this country eight times before that crash. Now he is on the run. Jessica Vaughn from the Center for Immigration Studies discussed the case on the Contributing Factor podcast. The first problem is that he is able to get back in all those times after being deported, and that's an indication that our border is not particularly secure. There are very credible studies that have estimated that at least half of the people who try to cross illegally are going to be able to succeed. Joining us now from Chicago to respond, Steve Cortez, who was a member of the Trump campaign's Hispanic Advisory Council, and from Washington, Ali Norani, executive director of the National Immigration Forum and author of the forthcoming book, There Goes the Neighborhood. So, Ali, I'll start with you. You have this guy, Miguel, deported eight times. He had a, he had a rap sheet uh, in and out of a bunch of different cities, killed two people in a hit and run. And you're saying you do not want the federal immigration authorities to know about a guy like this? Well, first of all, I, our thoughts and prayers go out to the families of these two young women who were killed in this tragic, tragic incident. It's, it's an awful, awful thing. What we're saying is that the best way to make sure that individuals like this who have made into the country, that they are found by federal immigration enforcement, yes. is to shrink the haystack of the 11 million undocumented so that they are valuable law enforcement resources can pursue individuals like this. The best way to do that is to make sure they have a path to legal status, they're passing a criminal background check, Wait a second. and ultimately they're paying their taxes. Wait a second. Your strategy here is to shrink the haystack. In order to prevent something like this, all you have to do if you're a municipal official and the guy comes through the booking unit, pick up the call, hey, feds, ICE, this guy's illegal, he's not here, he just committed a crime, why don't you go pick him up? That, is, that's all you have to do. And that, you're absolutely right. That We need to tighten our communication between uh, local law enforcement. When somebody has been brought into the facility and has been convicted of a crime, 
that person should be run through these databases, and if they are here illegally and have convicted, uh, uh, no, no, committed no, no. A, a, not a violent after crime, you've they been convicted be of a crime. When you're brought in, when you're Let's booked, when you're arrested database. for a crime, call up ICE. Say this guy's not here illegally. You might want to put a detainer on him. Um, listen. Steve, you agree, this is solvable, this isn't rocket science, this is easy, I mean, this right, is preventable Jesse, it, tragedy, I mean, I don't know what Ali's talking about. It, it's solvable and it must be solvable, because let me tell you this too, this, what's interesting about this terrible tragic case also, and I think it's emblematic, is that the victims uh, happen to be legal Hispanic immigrants. And by the way, who are most terrorized by illegal immigrants? Generally, it's legal immigrant communities, it's cops. It's not people like, by the way, I live in Chicago, uh, where Mayor Rahm Emanuel proudly boasts that uh, we're going to have a sanctuary city. Well, guess what? Rahm Emanuel is guarded by 24-hour taxpayers provided police protection. He doesn't have to live with the consequences of having dangerous people who are hiding in plain sight, yeah. who often terrorize American communities. And by the way, many of them, people with names like Cortez and Romero and Martinez. He doesn't have to live with that. He's not the cop on the beat who has to deal with the day-to-day -day consequences well, of these policies. It's one of the reasons, by the way, that Donald Trump won, is we are sick and tired of Americans of having elites make policies that might benefit them, but they don't have to live with the on-the-ground ramifications of those policies. Ali, Steve makes a good point here, and this is one of the reasons that contributed to the Democrats losing, is you have these illegal immigrants that come here, take Americans' jobs, commit crimes, don't pay any taxes, and then get special treatment by the government, where law-abiding, tax-paying American citizens, they're just left out to dry. Go so ahead, last er, er, point. Every Every police officer and sheriff, deputy sheriff in the country takes a, a, an oath to serve and protect their community. They believe, and we have worked with dozen, you know, over 100 um, law enforcement officials across the country. I've toured the border with them. What they tell us to a person is that the best way for them to serve and protect their community is to have the trust of the entirety of their community. So as soon as local law enforcement starts to ask Jose for his immigration status, if Jose is undocumented, they are not going to report a crime. So yes, well, Ali, the, 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 uh, criminal, Ali, the criminal the element, people that the, represent the, the Border Patrol actually endorsed Donald Trump for the yeah, first time and Jesse, ever. And he's against sanctuary cities. So there you go, guys. The I gotta run. Gotta run. All right. For more on the story, you can access the full contributing factor podcast, hosted by producer Robert Samuel on BillOReilly.com and iTunes. And a quick reminder: Killing the Rising Sun, Bill's big, huge bestseller, looks to be the biggest-selling adult book of the year, and it makes an excellent Christmas gift. Also, Bill's kids' book, Give Please a Chance, is number one in its category. Go to BillOReilly.com. Become a premium member and you can get any book free. And when we come right back in the personal story segment tonight, an internet personality known for making hoax videos now claims he was kicked off a Delta Airlines flight in London this morning because he was speaking Arabic in a phone call to his mother and a friend. Here's what Adam Sela claims happened. We spoke a different language on the plane and now we're getting kicked out. That's insane. Now we're getting kicked out. We're getting kicked out because we spoke a different language. Is it, is, this is 2016. Crazy. 2016, look, Delta Airlines are kicking us out because we spoke a different language. Because we spoke a different language. Thank you so much. You guys are racist. I cannot believe my eyes. I cannot believe it. I spoke a word, a different language, and you said you feel uncomfortable? Because I spoke a different language? I, I can't believe it. I can't believe my eyes. Why are you guys doing this? Because we spoke a different language. That's so like sad. That is so and you guys, are you serious? I'm about to cry right now, seriously. Because we said a word in a different language and there's six white people against us bearded men. Delta says it is investigating the incident. But Sailor's version of the story is already being disputed by other people on the plane. Joining us now for reaction in Los Angeles is Brian Claypool, a civil rights attorney, and Wendy Patrick, a trial attorney. So I just want to clear the air here uh, in the spirit of full disclosure. I am a gold medallion member at Delta. Very, very close to platinum medallion. Okay. And uh, I'm always Conflict in the sky lounge. I just want to put that out there so no one so can much, say Jesse. I'm so in the my. tank here. But if you look at this guy's track record, he's a notorious hoaxer. He's done this numerous times. And the playbook seems to be make white Americans look 
Islamophobic. So when something like this happens and you only see half the video, you kind of have to wonder what's really going on here. Now, if you're on a plane and 20 people complain that you're being a disruptive force and it's making those 20 people feel uncomfortable, doesn't it make sense that this person might be contacted and might be asked to leave the airplane? I'll start well, with Jesse, you. It's a balance. Uh, I was going to say it's a balance of safety over sensitivity. And you know, Brian and I usually are in court with he said, she said. This is he said, they said. Twenty people created. They, they said these men were creating a disturbance. That's an environment where Delta is going to really value safety over sensitivity. In other words, they don't tolerate discrimination, but they also don't tolerate disruption. I'd want to see more of the story before arriving at any kind of a conclusion in this case. Call, All right, Brian, your, let's, let's hear from you. Calling your mom is disruption? Jesse, calling your mom on the phone is disruption? Maybe they this, were having a huge is, fight. Is, Maybe mom was mad. <laughs> he wasn't coming back for the holidays. You don't know what happened. And you don't know what happened because hey, hey. there's no video of it. So you don't even know if he well, was talking to his mother. And people on the plane dispute that he was talking to his mother. So you don't know, do you? Well, look, look. This I, I looked up the motto, Jesse. You probably know the motto for Delta Airlines. Their claim is the most trusted airlines in the world. Their new motto should be the most insensitive airlines in the world. This incident is about two things, two words: racial profiling. No question about it. There are no red flags at all, Jesse, leading up to people reporting Sailor. For example, nothing raised a red flag when he went through security. Hmm. Nothing that he did other than talking on the phone raised a red flag. Remember the shoe bomber case? I could see if somebody saw him maybe fiddling around with a lighter or fiddling around with his, his uh, ankle, but no. People just reported him because he's speaking Arabic. I mean, this sets race you relations back 50 years. Brian, you don't know what happened because you weren't on the plane. And you also well, don't know do you what think? happened because there is no video of what happened until You're after the incident. So for you to make all these claims point, like you know exactly what happened, you don't know. So well, why don't you let the facts come out before you jump to conclusions what? like 20 racist well, people on a plane got this yeah. guy booted. Right, Wendy? What we should right, be what? doing now, Jesse and Brian, what we should be doing now, instead of finger pointing, we should be fact checking. What was the disturbance that these men created that caused 20 passengers to say that they felt uncomfortable? Because the three of us don't know that, and the investigation is continuing, it's impossible Wendy, to know no. whether Delta was is a culture of respect, as they say, or racism, as he says. But yeah. in order to find that out and to find out whether or not they actually did violate their motto, as Brian says, we're going to have to learn the rest of the story just like we would in a real court. We're trying right. this case in the court of public opinion. Wait, are you kidding right. me? It should be tried. <laughs> No. In a court of you law. know what this looks like? This looks like that has no. the potential of being one of those fake news stories that gets picked up, goes viral, no. and the next day we find out what really you, happened, you and everyone's already you, moved on. But we got to run, guys. Thank you very that. much. I will see you in the Sky Lounge. Up next on The Factor, another outrageous statement from Uber left celebrity Lena Dunham. You won't believe what she said this time. Directly ahead. In the back of the book segment tonight, yet another outrageous comment from a far left Hollywood darling. Actress Lena Dunham is under fire for saying on her podcast that she wished she had an abortion. So many people I love, my mother, my best friends, have had to have abortions for all kinds of reasons. I feel so proud of them for their bravery, for their self-knowledge, and it was a really important moment for me then to realize that I had internalized some of what society was throwing at us and I had to put it in the garbage. Now I can say that I still haven't had an abortion, but I wish I had. Wow. Dunham later apologized for her remarks on social media, saying it was a, quote, distasteful joke, unquote. With us now for reaction in Washington, D.C. is Crystal Wright, who blogs at conservativeblackchick.com. Now, I have to admit, I do watch the show Girls. I think it's a funny show. And she's kind of a quirky girl, uh, very intelligent, uh, very talented. But now, she's kind of reached the disturbed zone. I almost feel sorry for her. And do you think there's something wrong with her? Because I personally think there's something wrong with her. I think there's something very wrong with Lena Dunham because she's basically saying that in order to be a modern-day feminist, 
you have to get pregnant and kill your baby through abortion to fully experience the pro-choice movement. Really? And, and you know, this isn't the first time, Jesse, we've seen weird things from Lena Dunham. When she was seven years old, she looked at her sister's vagina. I mean, I'm not going to say other unsavory things that she did when she sat next to her sister at seven years old. She sounds perverted. I, I mean, pure evil. I, I don't know what, how you describe it. She talked yeah. about garbage. What's coming out of her mouth is garbage. Yeah, and it certainly does not help the pro-choice movement when you have some radical militant feminist trying to be icon come out and say these things and then have to apologize and clarify afterwards I think everybody wants abortion to be rare and safe correct and it's a very personal issue and it's a very delicate issue and when you come out and frivolously say oh yeah I wish I had one right. it discredits the whole pro-choice movement well, and to your point, Jesse, I don't know any woman who goes around saying she's happy and smiling that she had an abortion. And it's what's distasteful is that Lena Dunham thinks it's okay to joke about abortion. And some women actually have to have abortion because of life-threatening situations. So let's not, like you said, I, I want this to be rare, a rare occurrence. I mean, we're not, you can't you know, I'm not going to get into the debate about abortion, but it's a life inside you. And what she should be doing if she wants to empower women yep. with choices is to say, hey, birth control, abstinence, or adoption. Right. Well, That's luckily, empowering. I don't think she has that much influence <laughs> among young women, thankfully. Well, I don't, and, I don't uh, know. She, and Crystal, yeah, obviously, but, she has no influence over you. Thank you very much. No. <laughs> and that is it for us tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm Jesse Waters in for Bill O'Reilly. And please remember, that the spin stops here because we are definitely looking out for you.